Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us tonight, and welcome to the eighth talk in our grassroots speaker series, which was organized by TSME Mission Work staff. Um, it's here to highlight the creativity, resourcefulness, and resilience of grassroots organizers. Um, and just a few quick notes about the event. Um, there's food in the back, help yourself. It's from Norma Rosario's Catering, which is a local business that's part of the Ujima Good Business Network. Um, there are bathrooms out the door and to the right and a gender neutral bathroom on the fourth floor. Um, we'll be live streaming tonight's event. Um, if you don't want to be photographed, you can take a red sticker. Um, and we'll be looking at the um, comment box on Facebook. So if you're joining us for the live stream, please feel free to put your questions there. Um, we'll pass it around a microphone so everyone can hear your questions. Um, for live stream viewers, we, are, uh, we have um, simultaneous interpreting in the room for this event, um, but it won't make it onto the live stream. So the, f um, the first portion of the event will be in English and the second portion will be in Spanish. We will be providing dubbed videos um, entirely in English and entirely in Spanish after this talk. Um, so that brings me to uh, introduce our featured speakers. I have the honor of introducing Katarina Lorenzo and Seraf Suong. Um, Katarina is a Kanhobal Maya woman from Guatemala, in her, uh, first in her family and one of the first in her village to attend university. With an extensive background in human rights work in Guatemala, she has been organizing uh, also since she moved to the U.S. in 2013. She serves as the director of the Alliance to Mobilize Our Resistance, AMOR, as well as the immigrant uh, rights group uh, Colectivo Sin Fronteras. And Saraf was born refugee after his family fled Cambodia during the American War in Southeast Asia. He is a co-founder and executive director of the Providence Youth Student Movement, PRISM, and also serves as the national coordinator for the Southeast Asian Freedom Network. Um, please join us in welcoming Kata and Saraf. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I know you must be a little bit mad at us, but thank you for staying. Thank you for waiting. Hi, Trina. Um, all right, so thank you for the wonderful introduction, Nora. Um, and thanks, TSNE, for inviting us, um, for having us come here and talk about our work in Rhode Island. Um, so again, my name is Sarath Suong. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am queer. I am a refugee. I am Khmer. It's a language in the people from Cambodia. Um, and like Nora said, I am the, currently the executive director of Province Youth Student Movement. Um, and we are based in, it's too loud? Oh. We are based in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, is it still too loud? Okay. okay, great. We are based in Providence, Rhode Island. I like to think of Rhode Island as the smallest state with the biggest heart here in New England. Um, we're the third largest city in New England, right after Boston and Worcester. Um, and the city itself, the capital city, is predominantly people of color with um, beautiful communities, immigrant communities. There's a strong black community there. And about 180,000 people live in the capital city um, with just over a million in the whole state. So it's kind of small, right? But I think what we want to talk about tonight is highlight the work that we do there and also make a case about how a small state and a small capital city and province can also have impact on the national level. So a little bit about PRISM. So PRISM started over 17 years ago. We're celebrating our 17th year this year. Um, and it started when Southeast Asian young people, when I say Southeast Asian, I mean those from whose families we settled here from the countries of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, due to what we call, or, the, or here in the US call the um, Vietnam War, but we, what we know, know it as the American War. Right. Um, so those who came in the 70s and 80s um, came to the United States as refugees. Um, and I was born in the largest refugee camp in Thailand. I was born in a camp north, uh, close to the border of Cambodia and Thailand called Khao Um My families were farmers from the countryside of Cambodia, from the north uh, western province of Wattenbong. 
and like hundreds and thousands of other refugees in the 70s and 80s, we escaped war, we escaped genocide, and we settled here in the US. Province of Rhode Island's Southeast Asian community grew and developed in the 80s when there was a need for low wage labor in the jewelry industry. It was a big jewelry industry that, that grew up, and then South, we, Southeast Asians heard about it and all sort of fled over there um, to work in the jewelry factories. Um, and it was also around that same time in the 80s, late 80s, was when the province police department actually created the gang database to survey, to keep track of, and to profile Southeast Asian youth and gangs in the city of Providence. So when PRISM came together in 2001, we talked about what it felt like to grow up seeing the police drive, drive down your street every day, watching them, young people were telling, we were talking about how watching them take, take pictures of each other, knowing our information and putting our faces into the secret database, right, to this like secret database the police has to keep track of us. Um, and we, thought, we talked about it, we came together and we created PRISM um, with the mission to fight back against police, get, fight back against the police, against the database, the gang database, but also to stop the pushing of our young people into a system that views and treats them like animals. So as Southeast Asians, uh, we came here because of war, so um, we knew in our heart that our mission is, must be to fight back against state violence, right? So this year, um, so to today, currently after 17 years, PRISM's base consists of uh, Southeast Asian young people, queer and trans youth of color, um, and survivors of state, and survivors of police violence. Um, we develop, we support, and we mobilize these communities to organize for, to build together a world uh, without police, without prisons, without borders, and without war. Pretty big vision. Um, we, we do a lot of amazing things at PRISM, but today I want to come and talk about specifically our campaign to pass the Community Safety Act, the one of the most comprehensive racial profiling legislation in the, in the country. Um, and the effort, and the, the effort it took to pass the Community Safety Act took us well over five years. Um, and uh, with a, we did it in coalition uh, of dozens of community groups with businesses, uh, with places of warships, with, with schools, and with other organizations. Um, PRISM was the, one of the lead organizations in the coalition to um, working with, uh, we're working with a co core coalition uh, with an organization that works with um, the black community in Providence, with, commu with an organization that works with undocumented folks, with PRISM, and then with a white ally group, American Friends Service Committee. So this core coalition built dozens of other groups to bring along, and for five years we pushed forward the Community Safety Act. Um, and um, the, first couple, the first couple of years was tough. The mayor did not want to talk to us. The city council, the chief of police, the commissioner sort of tried to avoid us. Um, and like organizers, we know how to get their attention. So, you know, we would go take a jog with Mayor Loza when he does his Sunday jogs at the park. We go to all the east side neighborhood meetings where he comes and speaks and makes sure he knows that we were there. We um, held sit-ins at City Hall um, to make sure that um, uh, they listen to us and that they respond to us. It wasn't up until maybe after uh, the election of the, uh, the new administration took over uh, the White House that things started heating up for us. And so it was around that time um, that we, are, we knew that we must sort of redouble our effort and go for the final push. Um, and, and, and on June 1st of 2000, um, June 1st of 2017, we finally passed the Community Safety Act with a vote of 13 to one by Providence City Council. <laughs> so the CSA itself um, is huge. It has 12 provisions in it, and that's why we also call it one of the most comprehensive racial piece of racial profiling legislation. 12 provisions in it. Um, we have some information in the back that breaks it down even further, um, and I can get, send you all like the copy of the law itself if folks want a copy of that. Um, but the law explicitly prohibits police from profiling on the basis of race, of ethnicity, of color, of national origin, use of a foreign language, gender, 
gender identity and or expression, sexual orientation, political affiliation, religion, housing status, physical or mental disability, or a serious medical condition. The CSA requires the police to inform people of their right to refuse a search and requires the police to provide a searcher of the gender appropriate to the individual's gender identity and requires the Farmers Police Department to develop a policy on encounters with trans and gender nonconforming individuals. Police may not inquire about a person's immigration status. Um, and any identification that's issued by a government outside the US, like a consular ID, like a foreign driver's license, or a passport, will be accepted the same as an ID from the US government. And province police is prohibited from working co collaboration with federal agencies such as ICE, making Providence a sanctuary city, at least on paper, right? at least on the, with the laws. So I told you all a little bit in the beginning, PRISM came together, really our first initial thing was the gang database. CSA, one of the provisions of the CSA is about the gang database. And so we, you know, we started out with a mission to dismantle it with the CSA. We didn't totally dismantle it, but we definitely made a dent in it. And so when we were doing, sort of doing the campaigning for the CSA, we started talking about the, the key different provisions. And I think one of the biggest successes coming out of it was that Providence knows now that there is a secret gang database. Just even blowing that up and making the public know and understand that the police has had compiling information through a, a secret database was actually really important. Um, and for a lot of the folks that we were talking to and build a coalition with, that was a key piece that made them jump onto the side of the CSA. Um, so before, um, before the, before the CSA, um, adding, um, but before the CSA, they could just do nothing, whatever they wanted with the gay database, right? But after the CSA, under the new law, individuals have the right to ask whether they're in the gang database and are entitled to, to get a written response from the Department Department to um, say whether they're in it. And once they do, they have a right to appeal their inclusion in the database, right? So it's opening a lot of different doors for the community, for the young people to get their names off this database. But before adding any individuals who are 18 years or older, the police department must write must send a written notice to the, um, to the individual and their parent or guardian, right? Um, and if the individual is not convicted of any crime within two years, then their name must be removed from the database. So under the new order, also under the new ordinance, the gang data, with the gang database, the police department must do an annual audit of the gang database, a third party audit, right? So a third party must come in, do an audit of the database, uh, including a breakdown by age, by race, by ethnicity, and by gender. And this report must also include the number of people who have also appealed their, their inclusion to the gang database. This in itself is an unprecedented amount of transparency into the, the police department's policies. Um, and it also provided us a way to chip at and to take apart a gang database, a policy that has um, that has targeted and criminalized Southeast Asian youth for decades in the city of Providence. So to pass all this, we also knew that we as PRISM could not do this alone. And so it was important for us and it was important for our values as a movement building organization to work in coalition. Um, and so, um, you know, I, we wanna say that the intersectional, that the, vic the victory, the passage of the CSA um, is an intersectional victory. Right, so that means that it, showed, it sort of shows what is possible um, when a policy effort that's led by youth of color in the community organization space that has been building the leadership of queer and trans youth in our community for the past two, almost two decades. The ordinance centers the concerns of young people, of youth of color, and makes sure that queer youth and trans youth are vital to the local movement for police accountability in Providence, right? Um, and we made sure that every action, that every rally, um, every testimony that we spoke was also um, made sure we lifted up the intercession of racial justice, poverty, and queer liberation. And so, so but you know, we, as of June 1st, I mean, as of January 1st this year, the CSA is, is law. January 1st, 2018, the Community Safety Act is law in the city of Providence. 
And even then, we were, um, even before January 1st, the city, the mayor, the city council, and the police have already tried attacking it, taking it apart through amendments uh, to the CSA, through putting their own people onto the Civilian Oversight Review Board, um, to stacking it up, um, and to doing social media campaign, uh, social media blasts about how awful these groups are, how anti-police they are, how they train their young people to kill and fight the police. Just, you know, they go on, twi they go on Twitter and speak their mind, because um, that's what, I guess that's what you do nowadays <laughs> if you're a, a fascist, is just go on Twitter and just speak it, and just go on your rants. But, you know, we, immediately after June 1st, uh, January 1st, we started also going our own offensive, right? So we, after January 1st, we checked on the province police department and city's um, website to look at their policies. And so for, in particular, the gang database. So on June 2nd, we looked at their policies around the gang database. It was still the same as in 2017. So then we emailed them and said, that is actually illegal. <laughs> you have to take that down. Um, and, and immediately the next day, uh, oh, we, said, we threatened um, legal action against the city and the police. And then the next day, they said, you are right, we'll take it down. So, this, so as of right now, until they develop a new policy, the Palmer Police Department did not have any gang database policies published on, on, on the website. But, you know, we're still working on that, we're still tracking it, um, and we are, you know, the, for us, uh, the passage of the campaign was the fun, the sexy, the exciting work. It's the ones that the media comes out to. It's what it one gets everybody's attention. But even at the passage of us, what was really important to us is now is the implementation work, right? It's the implementation of a law that has a whole city and a whole police department um, that's also that you're also fighting against them, but also trying to implement this law. So, you know, the mayor made every effort to delay and weaken the ordinance. Um, working with city councils to really uh, chip away through the amendments. Um, and for us, it was like one, so for us, the, the work is clear now. One, we have to make sure it goes into policy and that the city and the state and the police does what it needs to do to, to go in compliance with the CSA. But we also do in the work of actually talking to our communities for them to understand what the new rights are and what the new rights are not under the CSA. Um, so, another, so the last thing I want to talk about is that the CSA is law in Providence. We finally have a tool, this community's finally, the, our communities finally have a tool to be able to push back against the police, right? Um, but we also know, and we've been knowing that laws will not, only, will not save us. We know that actually we must depend on the community on us to save, to save each other. So for the past few years, and actually really for the, since the past 17 years for PRISM, we've also been working hard to develop the systems in our neighborhoods, in our communities to defend each other, um, especially in a post-Trump era. So our youth organizers, the PRISM family, um, who campaigned for the Community Safety Act, while campaigning, we've also been building um, the community defense that we need in our, in our neighborhoods. So that means regular, consistent cop watch every week. We, ha we, we have a system of neighborhood uh, block by block cop watch. Um, that means that we develop not just know your rights uh, workshops and, um, and presentations, that we also really talk about uh, how do you get your rights in that moment of, um, of police brutality. Um, we're building a database of crooked cops, um, knowing that they have a database on us. We are developing a public database of all the different police officers and their fences and their files so the community can know who's, 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 who's coming down their streets. Um, and at the same time, we've also been building a legal and a legal part of PRISM to support people and uh, survivors who have a run with the police and want to take legal action, whether that's to file a complaint, whether to sue the cop or get their drops charged. In addition to all that, we also try our best and work really hard to provide the mental and emotional support for families and for individuals who, 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 have, who have to go through such a traumatizing experience. So, um, you know, I think for us, as a group that believes that there should be no prisons, no police, 
your borders. You know, the, at times the CSA campaign and CSA itself, um, that there's, there was a challenge for us as an organization and as a movement family who believes in abolition around what the CSA is. You know, we know we were never under any illusion that the CSA um, was one step <laughs> towards a freer world. But we also knew that while we build that world, uh, while we move toward, towards it, we need tools like the CSA for us to be able to live, to, be, to live better, live a little bit better, more freer, until we get to that point. We also know that these, uh, these reform, and these policies, and these, and these laws, um, while they are important, what is even sometimes even more important is building the real networks, the real solidarity, the real communities, the real families in our streets and in our homes to really protect each other and redefine what community safety means. For us, it's not about more police in our neighborhoods. It's not about police that look like us. It's not about training the police, <laughs> about diversity, right? It's about how do we take back our streets how do we talk to each other as neighbors, as community members? How do we resolve conflicts um, in a way that is restorative and transformative? Um, and the other honest truth is we don't really know how to do that yet, but we are gonna try, and <laughs> we've been trying. And so for us, you know, in talking about this world, what a new world looks like after the prison wall taken down, um, it's very exciting for us, and we know that that's a better world than what exists now. Um, but we're very honest about not knowing how to get there yet, but we're also very intentional about making sure that we get there together. Um, so with that, we want, I want to show, make sure that I leave some time for some questions and, and answers with folks. But after, you know, after the, after the new uh, administration took over, we, I mean, it was devastating for everybody, right? And so we came together and we said, wow, okay. What do we do in this moment in this time? Um, and we knew then that we must come together more than ever to build a solid wall of resistance um, in Providence. Um, I just want to bring Tata up here to talk about the Alliance to Mobilize Our Resistance, which for us was a natural piece of the community defense work that we're doing. Let's see if I have enough hands to keep my papers on the microphone. Good afternoon. I need to know one of you. Sometimes I can't find the words. And so for me, it's a little bit better to speak Spanish so I can express my feelings a little bit better. So I'm going to speak in Spanish. Um, this afternoon, got to speak in Canoval Maya, her first language. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here this afternoon with all of you, sharing experiences with you. I know that you all have your own experiences as well, and hopefully we can exchange some ideas at the end of the activity today. Maybe you have some, some questions for me, or share some of your experiences, that would be wonderful. The, pronoun, the pronouns that I use are she and hers. Where do I come from? I'm a Maya Cajumba woman from Guatemala. I know that probably not all of you, you know the history of Guatemala, but I survived a terrible civil war in Guatemala that lasted more than 30 years in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and finished in 1996. But when they signed the peace accords in 1996, the war didn't really finish. In fact, it still continues. And the scars from that time continue to this day. Officially it ended, 
but in reality, the effects and the, the problems that brought about the war in the first place continue. So here I am, my family and my community um, fought a lot to save ourselves during this time. I was a little girl. I was born at the height of the genocidal violence in the early 1980s. And I know that many people had to make really terrible decisions during these years to be able to survive. Sometimes they even had to do terrible things. So if the army wanted to take repression on them, as they saw the army passing by in these different communities, killing as many people as they could, burning down the different communities. We saw bombs raining down the mountains around my hometown. So it was a very terrible and rough time. But here I find myself today in Boston, the United States, talking about these experiences. So what am I doing here? Well, with this coming from this background, being a woman, being an indigenous woman from a rural area, we're always the most marginalized of people. It's not like my profession or my career was to, you know, be someone who's fighting for human rights or women's rights or indigenous rights. Life demanded that I had to do this in order just to live. I had to fight and struggle three times more than many other people had to fight just to continue studying, to continue to find a job. And I suffered, although I'm not sure if it was suffering, it was just getting the basic food that I needed to continue studying, to pay rent on my house, to be able to pay the bus fare to go to school, to go to university. I was also able to get support from some really special people organizations through the years. Finding those sorts of resources, even if it means you have to work two or three jobs, is just something, a fact of life that we had to do. So in all of this process, fighting, uh, finding out and understanding what my rights actually are, figuring out how to fight for the rights that I have, was a process that took many years but was something that was fundamental in my life. And I realized at a certain point that not just being aware of that fighting for those, but teaching others about those same things is something that was very, very important. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm kata everywhere. In Guatemala, I was kata here in the United States. I'm kata. I have the same sort of mentality and orientation to the world. If I go to Japan, I'm going to be kata as well. <laughs> so here I am being kata with you this afternoon. And the only option I have in the world is to keep me fighting and struggling to defend these different rights of indigenous people, of women, of women's participation in politics, for example. And now once again, when I moved to the United States in 2013, I even got a different identity. Now I'm a migrant. And so I began to realize this process and communicate with different migrant communities, especially here in southern New England, understanding the particular problems that migrants face here in southern New England, how, how people live here, the way that they're discriminated against. I have many family members who are undocumented in several different states. So even though I'm, I'm doing fine here, I still see my people, my family members, my, my neighbors who are in the shadows are very much discriminated against and I mean that's not right. So, like Sarat said a couple minutes ago, after the 2016 elections, it was absolutely devastating for our communities, especially the, the migrant community and the undocumented community. What were we going to do? It was really, really difficult to realize this new reality which we're all moving into. Especially for those of us who are already involved, fighting for some of our rights in different aspects of our community, to begin to sort of imagine how we are going to support each other, support these different communities in this new political era that we're all entering into. So, as Sarath said a couple minutes ago, we had to do something. Before, maybe one of our biggest struggles was to pass uh, driver's licenses for undocumented people, something that you also tried to do here in Massachusetts. 
We weren't able to do it. And then after the election, we realized the stakes are that much higher. So after the elections at the end of 2016 and the end of 2017, different communities began to get together and to talk about exactly what we're doing. Which is when we began to form and talk about this coalition we've created called AMOR, the Alliance to Organize Our Resistance. We conceptualize it as a coalition or an alliance between six different organizations, grassroots organizations in Providence. We're a very diverse group of organizations or communities. And even though some people say, oh, well, these are just Latinos or these are just Mexicans, for example, we're much more diverse and much bigger than all these things. And it's something that we wanted everyone to be able to recognize both in the work that we're doing and in the different communities that our member organizations come from. The first one is PRISM, Provincial Student Organization. The second one is DARE, Direct Action. The third one is Coyote, Rhode Island. The fourth one is Collective Sin Fronteras. Refugee Dream Center is the fifth one. And the sixth one is FANG. All these organizations are affected in different ways by the changing political atmosphere of our country, which is why we all came together to take things into our own hands to begin to change and support our own communities that we're all a part of. So we began to talk about what, what could the solution potentially be to these new problems that we're going to be facing. And so when different people came from the different organizations or from the, the communities that are represented by these different member organizations, we were able to get together and think about the different um, worries or problems that people are facing in all these different communities that our members come from. So, as you know, we decided to name the coalition Amor, which of course in English means love, which we thought would be a good name for this because we want to approach these problems in this changing political atmosphere with this orientation of love. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to call it Amor. And after this, knowing everything that was going on, seeing the, the propaganda and the racist language and the hate language that comes from the current presidents, commenting hate in many different communities throughout the country. We saw this increasing wave of hate, of racism, many different laws passed in different, in different states and different communities that seem to us to be based in hate. We, of course, didn't want to support any of these ideas. Another important and strong reason why we decided to give a different spin on the way that we were going to try to address and change the political atmosphere and the atmosphere of rights in our country. So, immigration is an important topic in the Amor Coalition, and it is an important thing that we work on, important members of our communities, but we work on many different things above and beyond the Latino community or the migrant community. We talk about police brutality, we try to provide services for people who have suffered police brutality, or other hate crimes based on gender, religion, race, sexuality. None of these sorts of hate crimes or brutalities should exist, in my opinion. And so all these things are things that we're fighting against and trying to support people who've survived in our communities. So, we're all, we're all good at having opinions. I love having my opinions. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is take the next step to actually visualize strategies, concrete strategies in our community to be able to confront these sorts of uh, problems of racism, for example, of police brutality, and go beyond just our opinions and actually figure out how to react to, but more than react to, resist to these sorts of patterns in the community. So the organization 
started little by little, mostly with volunteers at first, and little by little we decided to make it a bit more concrete. And about exactly a year ago, we decided to hire our two staff members who we have, and I was hired as the executive director of Amor. We began in June of last year, formally as an organization, beginning to coordinate all the different member organizations and the communities they represented, and to figure out the different initiatives and services that we wanted to focus on during our first year of existence. At the very beginning, I was the only full-time um, worker for more, and I had one other uh, part-time employee so it was really difficult because we had such a small staff and we had a, a large volunteer network so we tried to figure out what's our capacity and what what are the things that we want to prioritize that we want to focus on in terms of services and in terms of initiatives in the community so what we did is we, we began to split people up into different work groups and between these different work groups, they're able to tackle different of our central themes and problematics of our grassroots communities. So one is about immigration. Another one is about police abuses. So when, if someone's rights are abused by the police, then the police brutality working group is able to work with them. Another one of the important work groups we have is about mental health, especially culturally appropriate mental health. Both trying to work with people who come from different cultural backgrounds and a community, but also training mental health providers in the greater Providence area to be even aware that there are people who have different cultural approaches to mental health and psychology, so they can provide a culturally appropriate mental health services of the people who have survived, for example, police brutality. Another important working group we have is transportation. Transportation, for example, if someone has to go to court, we can help them get there. We can help organize visits to, to prisons or really to any sort of activity of people in our community. It's another way that we can sort of help support people out to make things a little bit more easy and accessible in the community. Along with transportation is also interpretation, another important thing that we try to provide. There are so many different <laughs> there are so many different languages in the world. Um, right now, maybe the most easiest thing we've able to do is to organize Spanish to English, English to Spanish. But even amongst the Latino community in Providence, there are many indigenous languages spoken that we're working on and training people to be interpreters for. And also many of the other languages, for example, Southeast Asian languages that are spoken within our community and people need interpretation for. So our hope for the future is to build our capacity into many of these other languages in addition to just Spanish and English. So if someone has suffered some racist act or police brutality, we also have a support line that we launched several months ago this year. And so anyone in our community can call this with the problems that they have and we're able to sort of um, focus the resources that they need to these different working teams such that the person is able to resolve their particular problem in, in the best way possible for their particular case. It all depends, of course, on the details of the case, but at least people in our community are, are able to begin to feel a little bit more empowered when they see that there is this sort of support coming from the community itself without having to necessarily depend on what many people, especially communities of color, already feel like are exclusive um, institutions of the state that are sort of racist at their core. So community response, transportation, interpretation, police brutality, immigration, these are all important themes that get focused on through this support line that we have. So here is the number for our support line in Rhode Island. 
So we open this on Valentine's Day on February 14th of this year. The number is, as you can see up here, 401-675-1414. It's an easy, easy enough number to memorize, we hope. Um, and this is one way that we can have direct support with people who have suffered all manner of abuses in our community and so that we can connect them to services or help support them in a, in a number of different ways, especially through the different working groups that we have organized through AMOR. But the whole point behind all this is much of it has to come from the community members. We don't want to impose on anybody, you know, any of these sorts of services that they might not necessarily want. People are calling us and then we'll resolve their case in the way that they really want. Whether that's an immigration case or police brutality case or whether it's something relatively more simple like transportation or interpretation. One, another one of the principal uh, philosophical orientations in Amor is that everyone is able to help out, everyone is able to support. But something that I respect and really try to respect is everyone is able to support in the way that they see best for themselves. So we don't want to necessarily tell any of our volunteers or any of the community members who are involved in Amor how they should be getting involved and supporting. Um, they're able to decide that based on their interests, their talents, um, and what they see as the most pressing needs in the community. Okay. A couple of our higher profile public examples of cases that we've dealt with in the last year or so. In January or February of this year, a woman or nine named Lillian Calderon was an undocumented woman who came to the United States to Rhode Island when she was a baby from Guatemala. She she was following the proper processes to begin to legalize her status as she'd married a U.S. citizen. And at one of her appointments at the USCIS Service Center in Rhode Island, ICE agents were waiting for her outside and they arrested her and jailed her up here, actually outside of Boston. And so we helped out this case in a bunch of different ways, trying to put pressure on the different institutions so that they eventually let her out of detention up here in Boston and is able to get the legal support she needs to continue her legalization process. So we see these broken systems that continue to exclude people or unfairly target particular individuals. And we try to both provide support to the individuals who are suffering in these different cases like Lillian, but also change the larger systems that continue to reproduce these oppressions and inequalities. So that was maybe one of the most public of cases that we helped out and supported on. There are many other cases as well that maybe aren't so, so public and I'm not necessarily going to talk about the details of today. So, what have, what have we found through our work with Amor? Well, we'd like everything to be all, all nice and happy, <laughs> but of course we see the world actually isn't that way. Oh, so within all the operations of the organizations itself, we see lots of need to develop different internal systems of decision making or arriving at consensus. Because as we all know, things get really complicated really quickly. So, when we began to have these different discussions throughout the last year or so, and more, we talk about resistance. We have, some of us have different definitions of exactly what resistance actually means. Or when we try to deal with some of our grassroots communities, sometimes 
when no, someone in the community no. members hear no, words like resistance, no, they get scared and they don't necessarily no. want to deal with us anymore because they think they might be getting involved in something that sounds you know, alarming or scary to them. So we try to talk about the vocabulary that we use in our work and what the philosophical orientation behind that vocabulary is that makes sense both for our own philosophical orientations but also with many of the different community members that we try to support and work with. So what we try to do is focus throughout all these different processes and more of the positive experiences of living together in our communities and leave aside some of the more negative experiences or, I guess, opinions that some people express. Many people are very traumatized by much of the violence and exclusion they pass through, whether that's due to the color of their skin, or maybe their sexual orientation, the different discriminations that all of us feel. And for us, it's really important to focus on these systems of oppression and trying to change these underlying systems while supporting individual cases, trying to change the larger patterns of oppression that add up to these systems of oppression. So some people, for example, say that they don't want to work with sex workers, and we're, we're not in agreement with that. We want to work with everyone who needs support to change these larger systems of oppression in the community. So those are some of our philosophical orientations and some of the reasons that we work as a more. So, as always, I ask for support. You don't necessarily have to be in Rhode Island. At, at the beginning, we always said that we're in Rhode Island, we're in Providence, we're talking about Rhode Island, but then we realized we realized that the same sorts of things happen all over the place. In fact, we've had many cases of people in Massachusetts, even up here in Boston, whether it's requests for interpretation to interpretation. There's so much movement back and forth from Providence to Boston. So we see that our communities are very really connected. So it's not just in Rhode Island, not just in Providence. So even if you don't live in Rhode Island or in Providence, if you live here in Boston or in Massachusetts, there are still ways in which you can help out. Supporting different actions that we do, whether it's something like an art build. So at the table at the back, we've got information about our work and our organizations. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved in some sort of way, come and talk to us. You can talk to me and talk to Sarah. And now I'm going to leave some time for questions. both. Um, I, I had a question just about uh, what kind of infrastructure support do you need? And I'm thinking about the Amor network, uh, especially as you really start to like clarify and solidify how the network works and the different stakeholders and support systems within the network. What kind of support do you need to around that, to build that up, make that run more smoothly? Um, and then also, uh, Sarath, now that the, you talk about the backlash that you face now with the law being on the books. And so if you can just speak very briefly to the kind of support that you need uh, around dealing with the backlash. Sí. Uh, en amor, pues, como había dicho, 
Muchos de nosotros somos de la comunidad y no, no sabemos mm -hmm. Many of us are community members who don't necessarily know technical things about like finance, for example, or like technical details of, of how to run an organization or good at it. And we have a background in all organizing communities, but especially like different community resources like for example just how to like organize events and like get like chairs and seats and stuff or even getting space for meetings like when we talk about the mental health meetings like having a, an appropriate and adequate cultural space that people feel secure in to talk about these important and delicate themes is, is really important what kind of infrastructure support do we need um, we always need more money. Um, so great, so you know, lots of money, lots of multi-year funding, general support funding, all that stuff, right? Um, but I think part connected to that are um, the need for philanthropy, for foundations, and for funders to also understand um, the unique needs of organizations like PRISM, right? That we don't fit into, a, sometimes, oftentimes we don't fit into the silos or the sort of portfolios of different areas of work. We're all of that. Um, so we need funders and philanthropy to have a better understanding about the, the new intersectional way of organizing and the doing this work that doesn't fit into the old models, right? Um, but in addition to that, um, also needing the, su the support and the resources around technical assistance, around, uh, around things like digital security, around um, how to face, uh, you know, how to prepare yourself to face opposition or attack, um, how to make sure your books and your stuff and everything's in order. Um, you know, because we, we learned a few hot lessons along the way in fighting for the Community Safety Act with, you know, both of us, as, all of us as individual organizers, but as an organization, have been targeted, right? And so, um, so we, yes, we need resources so that we can build our own internal community defense as an organization and as a movement families. Um, we need as much um, resources and uh, TA as possible that folks can give us. Um, and we also need, um, you know, folks in the movement, whether you're like a TA provider or a funder or a foundation or even a colleague or comrade organization um, to, I think, in this moment really uh, stand with us in terms of our values, in terms of the work we're doing. Um, and, to, um, you know, and then I think particularly for our work with the more and through a more and stuff, building right now between Boston and Providence, building those relationships, because our folks who are picked up in Providence are being held in Boston too. So keeping those communication and those relationships alive and, and, and thriving would be really helpful to the rapid response work. Um, more, resources, we have more resources and more connections. We also need immigration lawyers, criminal lawyers. Not, okay, so not everyone who has a criminal process against them is obviously guilty, right? But having access to competent legal support is really important. Members of our communities, it's very easy to criminalize them in that they don't have the resources to be able to adequately defend themselves. And so we're always looking to build our capacity in these areas. So I, oh. we also need to know more like um, culturally competent mental health counselors or psychologists or character leaders. So also, oh, we just need to, to generally sort of grow our, I guess, volunteer grassroots support base such that more, more people involved and less burnout as always happens with these sorts of organizations. So I was recently at a community forum where I live in Cambridge, um, which was put on by the city government and the city police department. Um, about the gun violence in our neighborhood, which is the most gun violence in Cambridge. Um, 
And I was trying to figure out what I could say in a meeting like that as a white person with class privilege who has recently moved into the neighborhood. Um, but many of my neighbors who are longtime residents, people of color, people who live in affordable housing, were all calling for more police presence um, in the neighborhood as a response to the gun violence. And I, as an abolitionist, that was not what I thought would necessarily be productive for our neighborhood, but I was um, unsure of sort of like what, what position to bring as, you know, a person new to the community as a white person. Um, do you have experience from your organizing with PRISM and the Community Safety Act that would be relevant to working in the sort of mixed neighborhood that I'm talking about? Yes, a um, lot of layers to that question. Okay, uh, yes. So a lot of the, um, you know, so the reality is that in fighting for this, uh, for the Community Safety Act, there's a lot of communities of color, right, um, who actually like, or members of the community, or members of communities of color who have either spoken publicly or came to meet with us and talked about us. Actually, we feel more safer with police, and actually, like you know, we should be doing these trainings. And actually, why are you all fighting the police? Um, and, um, and then we have, you know, we definitely have those white folks that are like, no more crimes in our neighborhoods. People are stealing the pots from our porch, up the plants from our porches. We need more cops. Um, and, and, um, and we have those folks. And then also you have the neoliberal folks, right, who are like, who are like yeah, we believe in like, communities of color being um, safe and stuff. Um, but, you know, they will support, like, things like a neighborhood crime watch or something. Anyways, um, this, we run the gamut, right? And so for us, it's like um, we, t we actually try to take our time, more time and more effort to building those conversations in communities of color because we know that, like, an idea around, like, uh, being anti-police or, like, oh, pro abolition and all that stuff is... Um, is a new idea and a new, um, is, is not a new idea actually, it's pretty <laughs> old, um, but it's a way of thinking that, um, that we also oftentimes have to really bring our communities and our families and our neighborhoods together in a way that, um, that sort of changes that, right? So it doesn't happen overnight. You know, for prison for over, almost two decades now, as we've been talking about these issues, um, and we still have to keep on doing it. Um, so part of it is like patience and, and, um, and, and, me, and meeting the community where they're at, listening to the, what are they actually saying? Are they actually asking for more police or are they actually asking for more um, for other things, right? So offering alternatives, offering solutions. Um, but really, like, it's hard. You're fighting back, uh, on condi uh, like, you know, against the social and uh, cultural conditioning of protection of what safety means, of, the, of loving the you know, loving the police state and the police system. Um, but for white folks in those neighborhoods, hearing that from, the, um, from neighbors and stuff, I don't know. I just feel, I feel like, um, one, just do what you did was actually just to listen. Um, so keep on listening. Don't talk too much. Um, keep on listening and then, um, uh, you know, gather with other, like, what other allies in the community um, to, to develop that, to talk about it, and then start making those connections with the, your neighbors and stuff and having those real conversations. Um, having a fight, public fight in the forum might not be the best way to go, um, but doing intentionally and slowly, because knowing that this stuff takes a lot of time to do it on condition. Yeah. Oh, over there. Kind of along the lines of what you said, um, I guess I wanted to ask about your experiences, right? So it seems like a lot of the work that you're doing is very revolutionary, which is important and awesome. So a lot of the conflict that I know my organization um, has experienced in the Boston area is that conflict between the necessary revolutionary acts like Cop Watch, right, versus um, the endorsement of like liberalism and electoral politics that comes with trying to get legislation passed. So that kind of line um, and walking that line in order to get justice, I'm curious about that. And I'm curious about what that does to you as organizers, because um, that's a, a huge hurdle here in Boston that I haven't really 
it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to get stuff done because once people view you as revolutionary, the liberals push you out. And then once you engage in electoral politics, the leftists consider you sellouts. So that's, yeah. navigating that has been a crux of the issue um, for me and my organization. I was curious about how you've handled that. Or have you, or what that's like for you experiencing that. It's very frustrating. Um, and you know, like, um, yeah. Uh, it's very frustrating. There's a little bit of, there's a lot of that actually also in Rhode Island and in Providence. Um, you know, um, I, you know I, I'll say that we don't really like, for us, it's like the work that we're doing, we're, first and foremost, we're responding to what our community wants and our community needs. I don't need, we don't need to be getting into arguments and fights with uh, IWW or like other folks, right? We, um, and also, like you know, we um, don't need to be, we don't want to be getting into fights with the neoliberals and all that stuff too, right? But what we do do is we build those relationships with other communities and organizations who understand that while we build that road towards abolition, we must also have, get these steps and these tools and these sort of steps for our community in order to get there, right? And if you like, if that's something you can vibe with and that's something that we can join together and work around with, then that's cool, let's do this together. Um, you know, so yeah, those, those, those arguments, those tensions and those conflicts can't be avoided. And oftentimes actually those kind of conversations are actually pretty helpful for us, especially with prison fam to actually begin, like continue having those kinds of conversations. Um, at the end of the day though, for us, uh, you know, we are clear about the, the kind of world that we want, but we also know that until we get there, we can do whatever we can to make sure that our people can breathe, right? But like, there's no, for me, there's no easy, easy answers and no easy stuff about how to get around that, but to stay focused on the work and what you believe to be true and right for our community. For us, it's always going back to what is it our community need right now? Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. I'm going to talk about my experience with politicians, with passing laws. I'm Guatemalan, I know how things work there. <laughs> there are so many, so many laws, they make so many laws, but they just rot away and they're not applied or put into any real force in people's lives. So either these laws are made by people who have the power to do them, they're made for a specific reason perhaps, not necessarily in the interest of the public or for particular communities. So for me, the lawmaking process isn't the only or maybe even the most important solution to many of our problems. This is not to say that it's not important, I don't respect that sort of work, but we're, we try to focus on other ways to meet the needs of our community and to change the exclusionary systems in which we live. The principal thing is, is, is listening to the necessities of our community. So I'm working. I'm working. I'm working to talk to our communities and try to communicate some of these to, politi to politicians sometimes. But we've seen so many times that politicians, I don't know if they just don't listen, but things end up being reinterpreted or changed around the political process. They might end up passing a law that's got, you know, the name of what we wanted to pass, but the actual content of what the law may or may not actually do is totally different than what our initial discussions were or the necessities that we heard from our community who wanted this law in the first place. So, in Rhode Island, there we saw a similar legal process like this with some of our city council members who we had a long process about creating a new law that was going to help to support people, especially like around driver's licenses, and throughout the entire process going back and forth in, in committees within the Rhode Island legislature. Basically, all the contents of it were totally changed around and ended up not helping the original people on the law in the first place. So, what do we do? So this is some of my experience with laws. <laughs> a little bit cynical about it. So us, 
Decimos or more, and we'll have a little bit of prison as well. We, we demand that the laws exist, of course, but what seems most important for us is that they're put into practice, right? Especially the ones that defend our rights. So these rights might exist, but we need them to actually be enforced in individual lives. So if I'm able to, if I'm able, if I'm not able to demand my particular rights, if I don't even know what they are and I'm not able to put them into practice, what good is it to me if the law exists, if I need my particular rights? Anyone have one more question? Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for sharing your inspiring story with us. Check out their information at the back table. Um, take their flyers. Stickers. Donate to their website. <laughs> yeah. Donate to more, donate to Prism. Let us know, how, how can we donate? Oh yeah, so if anybody's interested, on June 16th, we're having a movement grill off in Providence, uh, inspired by ARW's grill off, um, that happens every year. We're doing a movement grill off. So 10 organizations are gonna be competing in Providence, um, in Rhode Island, to see who's, um, you know, which team can win. So it all depends, huh? It's at Lincoln Woods Park, 12 to three, Saturday, June 16th. Um, and it's a benefit of more, so kata kata. Also visit, um, visit Prism's website, w.prism.us, to donate, um, and you could also donate for more through that. Just make sure you write in the little memo, it's for more. Yeah. Great, thanks everybody.